We've been looking at uh, Baptist history and then most specifically Southern Baptist history. And I've asked you this question each night, what is a Southern Baptist? And I've presented these ideas to you. We're a people who believe in conversion. Most notably seen or going public with that is the act of baptism itself. We're a people who believe in missions and we've traced the history of that throughout the Southern Baptist from prior to the Civil War to Lottie Moon, even into our own present day with the International Mission Board, we continue to be a mission-sending people. We're an evangelistic people. We're a people who seek to plant churches and win our neighbors to Jesus Christ. In addition to this, we're a cooperating people. We build structures and we work together through the democratic processes of our own church and with other churches to cooperate with one another. And then finally, I would suggest to you that as I think about what holds Southern Baptists together and we look at our history, we are a biblical people. We are a people who hold very high the Bible. I'll present to you and open this evening with a word of scripture. And the passage I'll read will be a passage that I have no doubt is familiar to each of you. But the passage I read comes from 2 Timothy, the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3. And there, towards the end of that chapter, here is what Paul writes to Timothy, beginning in verse 14. He says to Timothy, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We see here those key words, all scripture is inspired by God. We have continually been a people that hold high, that believe all scripture is inspired by God. Yet, as we look at Baptist history, I'd also add here, I think we talked about education being here as well, but I, and of course, that's biblical education first and foremost. But I'd also add, as we think about Southern Baptist as a biblical people, there have always been voices, or there have from our early days been voices that have asked the question, to what extent? What do you really mean by the idea that all scripture is inspired by God? A very early name that I'll mention to you is this one, Crawford Toy. I think I may have mentioned him briefly the last time I spoke. Anyone remember what Crawford Toy is known for? He was courting somebody. Anyone remember who he was courting? He was courting Lottie Moon is who he was going with. You know, Lottie Moon or the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. She's like this tall. She makes me look tall, which is saying something. Uh, Miss, Miss Lottie Moon and Crawford Toy were engaged to be married. But Crawford Toy went off. He, he was educated at Southern Seminary back when it was in Furman, South Carolina in the 1850s prior to the Civil War. He was a chaplain during the Civil War. And then after the Civil War, he went off and got some more education. Anyone remember where he went? Germany. He went to Germany. And while he was in Germany, he was exposed to German higher critical thinking about the Bible. Another term for this would just be liberalism. We want to get just very simple and straightforward there. He learned about what became known as the graf Wellhausen hypothesis. That the first five books of the Old Testament weren't written by Moses, but they were written by different competing groups. And you can suss apart and break apart which part is by which different book group. The Graf-Wellhausen hypothesis. 
Then he comes back to the United States. He's offered a teaching position there at Southern Seminary. And he ultimately breaks, Lottie Moon breaks off her engagement from him to go on the mission field because he no longer believes the Bible is true. And there, there's this very famous scene in Southern Baptist history that takes place where the president of Southern Seminary, John Broadus, is on the train platform. And he says to Toy, in effect, if only you were the same man you were before you went off to Germany and learned all this gobbledygook. So even from our earliest days, there's this question, this idea, these forces, and they always seem to come in from the outside, that come in and say, is the Bible really true? Is the Bible really true? Is it what it says it is? So you have Toy, who's a pretty famous example of this. Another example I'll give you is William Whitsitt. William Whitsitt is another example here. He's the president of Southern Seminary. He's good friends with Crawford Toy. He's president from 1895 to 1899. He had also gone to the University of Berlin to study. He'd learned its historical critical methods, and rather than applying it to the Bible, he applies those methods to Baptist. And as he studies Baptist, he publishes articles saying that Baptists aren't always there. There's uh, strong evidence against the existence of Baptist, Baptist, and he ends up having to leave as president of Southern Seminary, which at this point is our only seminary. You still got little LaGrange College up in LaGrange, Missouri going at this time, but still holding faithful to the uh, truth once for all delivered for the, to the saints. But you've got forces like this beginning to emerge in Southern Baptist life. There is this liberalism, and it has four key marks to it. It has an idea of uniformity. It wants to put Christianity in context of other religions. It wants to look at things in terms of comparative religions. It looks at Hegelian history. History is a synthesis and not providential. There's no God in history. It says, for example, things are just getting better and better over time. There isn't a God who is working history towards its ultimate end. There's a belief in ethical relativism. Reality is no longer objective, but it's subjective. Ultimately, what is true is what is true for one's community or for one's group. What's right and wrong is what is true for one's community or one's group. It's not what's true because that's what the Bible says. And then there is revelational absence. The Bible is merely the invention of a religious man. God doesn't speak to us. Rather, it is the invention of a religious man. And these thoughts begin to permeate at the edges of Southern Baptist life. These assumptions begin to exist there. And so that's turn of the 20th century. Now, there's a big thing beginning to rise in America at the turn of the 20th century. And it's happening in the public school system. Anyone want to take a guess as to what it is? Evolution. Yes, exactly. It is the theory of evolution. And so there is this beginning shift that is taking place within the wider world. So at the start of the 20th century with the rise of the theory of evolution. And what is the problem with the theory of evolution as it relates to Christianity? It leaves out God. It really is very hard to jive with the first couple chapters of Genesis. All right, those, those first three or so chapters of Genesis, theory of evolution, they're 
they're not working together well with one another. At least a literal, plain reading, seven days of creation, God's special creation of Adam and Eve there, which he places in the garden, and then their fall there we read about in Genesis chapter 3, which then permeates down to their entire lineage, all of humanity. That seems, well, that just is, that reading is incompatible with the idea that humanity has arisen from a lower life form. And so you begin to have this controversy that's affecting the churches more broadly and even beginning to nibble at the edges of Baptist life. Of the evolution. Boy, you can't read that at all. Let's try that again. There we go, that's better. Evolution controversy. And so there begin to be individuals, folks, who are, so these are influenced by... Germany, German, let me get this, German, you know it is interesting to me, just as an aside here, that so many of these ideas come out of Germany, and it is a higher education system that is moving in Germany away from God, and what is the end result in the German, for the German nation of that. Two world wars, Hitler, Nazism. That this German higher critical liberalism, which begins to try to think about, okay, how do we understand the Bible if there is no God or if God can't be known to us? These seem to be natural outflows there of that. So then you have the rise of things like the Scope Monkey Trial in 1925, which deepens the divide between Christians and the rest of society, where Christians were portrayed as ignorant and worse because the trial involved the educational system. Orthodox Christians were pushed to the fringes of culture. And then you have German higher criticism calling into question the Bible. So, what is the response of Southern Baptists? 1925. Baptists respond. And how do they respond? They respond with their first confession of faith. Believing the growing problem was redeemable, the SBC adopted the, its first Baptist faith and message in direct response to evolutionary teachings in diminishing orthodoxy. In 1921, a Baylor University sociology professor, so Baylor, large Baptist school down in Texas, was said to deny Genesis as history and that he was teaching evolution. The pastor of First Baptist Fort Worth, J. Frank Norris, begins to attack the Baptist General Convention of Texas and the professor. And the convention works there in Texas to pro protect him until the professor ends up resigning. So in response on a bigger level, on a national level, the SBC committee studies the New Hampshire Confession of, 19, of 1833 and takes much of its wording and they modify it and the Baptists respond with the BFN two, oh, not 2000, 1925. And so they put together this first statement, and I'm trying to see if I have a copy of some of the key phrases from the 25 that are there. But the big idea 
Y'all have seen the 2000 before. We've done that here in church. If you don't, I think you've probably got a copy, some copies of it back in the offices, don't you? I'd encourage you to pick up a copy of the current edition of the Baptist Faith and Message. We've got some we'd love to, to share with you or give to you there. Um, but the purpose of this was to begin to hedge in and narrow down and say, Baptist believe in the Bible. It is totally true and trustworthy. And yet, this first effort doesn't cut off everything. Liberalism, when you cut off one branch, seems to come in at three other angles. So, what happened? In 1939, at Mercer University, which is a Baptist school in Georgia, the top student there, their valedictorian, claimed that the Bible teacher, John Freeman, taught that Adam and Eve were mythical and that Christ's death was not necessary for salvation. Uh, the president of the school wanted to expel the student. His name was John Birch. Anyone heard that name before? The John Birch Society, that was the student at Mercer. Trustees, however, stood with Birch. The lesson there, or the professor, ends up resigning. The lesson there, which subsequent generations of Baptists would come to realize, is that the trustees, not even the president, set the ultimate direction for our entities. So, sometimes people will get mad at me over at Hannibal LaGrange for various reasons. I don't know why that is, but normally it's because of some decision the trustees have made. That's a joke, because we've got one here in the church, which is Bobby. <laughs> what do you think, Bobby? You think that's right? Okay, okay. Uh, The, uh, C.R. Daly, who's from Kentucky, he's the editor of the Baptist paper there, he, said, he went to Southern in the 40s. And he says, when I came to Southern, I can only remember one professor who stood up strongly for the mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch. Daly had been a contemporary of Birch's, but had sided with the professor who ended up being expelled because he became one of the liberal Baptist paper editors. So by the 40s at Southern Seminary, you had a fully liberal institution in terms of most of its faculty. And by liberal, I'm meaning there, they did not believe in some of the basic things that are found or that the scriptures claim for themselves, such as Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. And why would we hold that? Well, because that's what Jesus says. Jesus describes the authorship of the Pentateuch to Moses. So we see the Bible making that claim in and of itself. So this is what's happening kind of in, in the background of things. You have some conflict that is taking place. You have folks like Billy Sunday. Anyone heard this name before? J. Frank Norris, who I just mentioned to you, who was the pastor of uh, First Baptist Fort Worth, Texas, and John R. Rice, who are all beginning to, in different ways, give a voice to conservatives, both within the Southern Baptist Convention and outside of it, beginning to highlight some of these folks who don't hold to the scriptures as true. Another one there would be Bob Jones Sr., who founds Bob Jones University in South Carolina. So within the SBC, several voices from Germany begin to have influence. I'll cite three. Rudolf Boltzmann, he's a professor in uh, Tübingen, Tübingen Germany, or in Ber at the per University of Tübingen in Berlin, from 18, his dates are 1884 to 1976. He was strongly influenced by the existentialists, and he reads the Bible through the lens of what he calls 
So we'll say uh, all missed calls in to question the Bible. This is really 1870 through 1925. We respond here. So then, rising liberalism again. Right? This is, we're going to say 1925, and we'll go to here till 1978 cover about a 50-year period here. German uh, scholars continue to influence Baptist professors. And you've got Boltzmann who argues for demythologization. What do y'all think that means? He says the Bible is full of myths. And we've got to get the myths out of the Bible to find out what's actually true. That's what he's doing. Then you've got one like Karl Barth. And Barth is a fascinating one to read. But as he gets applied to Baptist life, it's spelled like Barth, but it's pronounced Bart. But what he says is that the Bible is not the Word of God, but sometimes it can become the Word of God to us. At least that's how the Baptist professors read him. So I'm doing these in order. They're all with B names. This is the worst of the three. This is kind of the middle. This is the best of the three. Bonhoeffer. You've probably heard that name before. A lot of good can be said about Bonhoeffer. He's anti-Nazi. Uh, he opposes the Lutheran church that's uh, supporting the Nazi party there in Germany. His Theological writings continue to be very influential to this day, but at times his writings are used in advance of what becomes known as the social gospel. Again, I would say that some of the things there to characterize all of him this way would not be fair, but sometimes he'll be used in advance of that. Anyone know what the social gospel is? What is it, John? Disaster relief. Campers on mission. Yeah. Soup kitchens. Here's another one, right? Crisis pregnancy centers. Yeah. Options for women is an example of this. Why would this be? Why could this become problematic? Yes. Oh, yeah. Comes works doctrine. But what often happens is, I had a college roommate who, or hallmate, who said this to me. He was not a believer. He said to me, Robert. Why is it that Christians are so concerned, I think I've told you all about him, so concerned about saving people's souls and not more concerned about going and helping people in need? Don't they know what really matters is helping people when they're in need? And we've always said it's a both and, not an either or. But taken together, what these do to the scriptures, to th thoughts about scripture, is that as young ministers return from World War II and the SBC seminary professors are increasingly teaching these sort of things, this becomes known as neo 
orthodoxy. Neo-orthodoxy. The new orthodox. And these pastors, they're teaching, well, what's, what's really important isn't necessarily that Jesus wo- uh, walked on the water or that Jesus fed the 5,000. What's really important is that we have faith and that we help those who are in need. That's what's really important. So getting away from the Bible. These new pastors that are being trained in this way would often lecture while the old-time pastors tended to preach. With shrinking attendance, these sort of pastors, their churches always shrank uh, and uh, or would often shrink, so then they would enter into denominational positions is what would happen, whereas... Uh, the more conservative pastors would grow larger churches believing in the Bible. And all of this is building from 25 to 78. And there's a few flashpoints that begin to develop. One happens over in Kansas City. A man by the name of Ralph Elliott. He writes a book in 1970. 62, called The Message of Genesis. It's a legendary book in Southern Baptist history. He argues, he's, the, he's a professor of Old Testament over at Midwestern Seminary in the 50s and the 60s, that chapters 1 through 11 of the book were purely symbolic. So Genesis 1 through 11, just symbol. The seven days of creation were not literal. Adam wasn't a reference to an individual person, but rather a reference to all mankind. uh, He argues that Moses is not the author. Um, I've got quotes from him here. They're a little hard to read. Uh, Here we go. Here's one. The context argues against the creation. So he's writing about Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 2. The context argues against the creation of a single man and a single woman. It would appear more probable that this passage is speaking of the creation of the human race. He talks about the flood. The question of a universal flood has occupied scholars for a long time. There seems to be little evidence from science that the flood was universal. All of this suggests the compiler of Genesis was using, notice not Moses, the compiler of Genesis, was using a local flood account only as a means of introducing the background and culture out of which the need arose. Um, He argues at one point that Abraham, when he tithes to Melchizedek, is actually tithing to Baal, the pagan god. Uh, He says God did not command Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. It certainly was not a literal command to sacrifice a life. Um, He argues that the biblical writers borrow and adapt from earlier myths and legends. Uh, Other creation stories have been found with such similarities as to, I'm now reading a quote, as to suggest either that the outline is borrowed from the framework to the contemporary world or vice versa, or they have borrowed and adapted from a common source. So it's not that God speaks to Moses to reveal the creation story, it's that it's borrowed. Um, And so, picture for a second, I mean, manual exists at this point, and you, you get word that there's a professor over in Kansas City and our tithe dollars are going to help pay his salary and he's teaching that. What's going to be your reaction? Hmm? Yeah, no money. So lots of Baptists are starting to get concerned. Ralph Elliott is one here. And there's lots of pushback. Elliot ends up being fired from Midwestern, not for being a heretic, which he was, but for being insubordinate, refusing to back away from the comments publicly. 
He was told, you can hold to that privately if you want, but you can't, uh, you've got to, you've got, you can't publish it. The end result of Eliot is the 63 update of the Baptist faith and message. So the Baptist faith and message gets updated in 63, but they still leave some wiggle room in it. And this sort of thing continues on. Ramsey Pollard, who's pastor was pastor of Bellevue Baptist uh, during this time, says this from the floor of the Southern Baptist Convention when he preaches the message. If you don't believe in the miracles in the word of God, get out of our seminaries. I'm not saying that because it is smart. I'm not saying it because it's trite. I'm saying it because Southern Baptists need to be on guard against false teachers within our own ranks. Your academic freedom stops at a certain point. So that's 63 or 62 or 61 is when this comes out. 63 is when the Baptist faith and message happens. Then 1969, there is the Broadman Bible Commentary. And this is uh, volume one. It's, I believe, Genesis through maybe, maybe it's just Genesis and Exodus. I think that's it. Doing that from memory. If you can ever find one of these, buy it and give it to me as a gift because I really want one because they're really, really rare and hard to find. And I'm getting ready to tell you why. The first volume was written by G. Hinton Davies of Oxford. It's on Genesis in 1969. Davis held to a, now, Broadman, Broadman Press, what is that? Anyone know? That's the Southern Baptist Convention's publishing house. Uh, Davis holds to a historical criminal, critical hermeneutic. In interpreting Genesis 22, he wrote, uh, so this is six years, at, or eight years after Eliot, six years after the 1963 Baptist Faith and Message, which I believe up until very recently was actually the faith statement of this church. I think we've only updated it within the last year, right? Yeah, I'm glad we did. And here, let me tell you why. Because this is what you could get away with within the context of the 63 Baptist faith and message. In interpreting Genesis 22, the author wrote that, or I'm sorry, Davis wrote that he did not believe that God had ordered Abraham to kill Isaac. What Christian or humane conscience could regard such a command as coming from God, he wrote. He wrote that Abraham's conviction that his son must be sacrificed is the climax of the psycho psychology of life. What does that mean? I have no idea. But there you go. He affirms that Graf Wellhausen uh, hypothesis. Uh, he affirms again the possibility of evolution. The book was banned at the Southern Baptist Convention in 1970. So you've got Baptist people over here who are like, what on earth is this gobbledygook? We believe the Bible. And you've got Baptist schools uh, teaching things like this. The book was banned by the SBC, but the Sunday School Board continued to secretly publish it in Great Britain, even after it was banned by the Baptist here in America. It was rewritten here in the States, which is why you'll see volume one if you have the, uh, the, Bible, uh, the, the Broadman Bible, I do. My volume one says revised on the bottom. Uh, but a lot of people still didn't like the revised version. I would add myself to that number. Uh, yet many Southern Baptist seminary professors support the commentary. So enter a man by the name, so you see the liberalism is still here. And you're hearing some of the pushback that is taking place. Enter W.A. Criswell. Any of y'all know that name? W.A. Criswell was pastor of First Baptist Dallas. And he wrote a book called Why I Preach That the Bible is Literally True. It's the name of his book. Famous pastor, is one of the largest Sunday schools in the world. 
He writes this in 1970. He was the president of the convention then. It was roundly condemned by all the professors in our seminaries. What an ignorant, stupid thing for this pastor to write, said all the seminary professors. Meanwhile, Hannibal LaGrange is up here like, we believe the Bible. But he never really wavered, just in case anyone's wondering. Um, lines begin to draw, be drawn in this decade, in the 70s. So throughout the 70s, there's clearly a building tension over the nature of Scripture, over the nature of what is appropriate for Baptists to do and to believe and to think. And what it, not to think, but what pos positions on the Bible are appropriate here. In 1958, you had 13 professors who were fired from Southern Seminary because their theology was clearly outside the parameters of the Baptist faith and message. But a mistake was made when they were fired. The official reason for their dismissal was insubordination. Rather than being prevented from teaching at other Southern, uh, teaching Southern Baptist students, all 13 of them find jobs at the two new Baptist seminaries. Seven find jobs at Southeastern Seminary, which opens in 58, and six find jobs at Midwestern Seminary, which opens in 61. So there is this liberalism that is infecting the entire convention. You can tell my perspective on this. Not a fan. Um, so what happened? What began to change all of this? Well, in the 1970s, two individuals begin to get together. One's name is Paige Patterson. The other's name is Paul Pressler. Both of them, at this point, have some significant black marks on their record, and we'll talk about that towards the end here. But Patterson is a seminary student at New Orleans Seminary at this point. Pressler is a judge and a member of First Baptist Church, Houston, Texas, and a Sunday school teacher there. And they are saying, what is going to happen to the Southern Baptist Convention? This is so troubled. We are so worried about what the type of pastors our seminaries are producing for our churches. And so they get together at Cafe Dumont in New Orleans, Louisiana. And over beignets and a cup of chicory coffee they begin to look at how the Southern Baptist Convention is structured. And what they realize is that the president of the convention can appoint the committee on committees one year. And the next year, that committee, because we're Baptists, we've got to have lots of committees, appoints the committee on nominations. And then the next year, the committee on nominations appoints the trustees as they rotate off the trustee boards of the different entities. And remember the lesson I shared with you just a minute ago? It's the trustees who determine the direction of the institution. They realize that if they want to change the direction of the convention, they've got to elect presidents who will appoint a committee on committees, which will in turn appoint a committee on nominations, which will in turn appoint the trustees that will hold the presidents of the institutions and the institutions themselves feet to the fire to hold to the Bible. And so they begin to put together a process to do just that. In 1979, for the very first time, 
they elect a president who understands that this is his responsibility as president. This isn't just an honorary position to go around and preach good sermons and moderate a business meeting for a few days at the convention. Rather, that the appointive powers are significant. And the man that is initially elected there is Adrian Rogers, pastor of Bellevue Baptist in Memphis, Tennessee. Adrian wins in 79. He refuses to stand for re-election. Bailey Smith, who pastored in Oklahoma City, pass, uh, wins in 80 and 81. Jimmy Draper, 82 and 83. Charles Stanley, 84 and 85. Uh, Adrian Rogers, 86 and 87. Jerry Vines, 88 and 89. Morris Chapman, 90 and 91. Ed Young Sr., 90 and 92 and 93. Jim Henry, 94 and 95. Tom Elliff, 96 and 97, and Paige Patterson in 98 and 99. Why do I trace so many years? Because that's how many years it's going to take for all the trustees to turn over. But the plan is simple at its core. We need presidents, we need leaders who hold to the scriptures. And so really, 79 through 88 are the key years. And there are some crazy things that happen. Both sides of the convention try everything they can to get out the vote. And in Dallas in 1985, when Charles Stanley runs for the presidency of the convention... It is all-out war. There are 45,000 messengers at the convention center in Dallas, Texas. They meet, I believe, in the old Texas, in the, the old Cowboys Stadium in order to hold everybody because the convention center can't seat 45,000 people. There's 30,000 members of the media there in addition to the 45,000 registered messengers. Stanley wins and he wins that year with 55.3% of the vote. It is all out. You think we've had conflicts in church. You've not seen anything until you get all the Baptists together to have a conflict. And so this is as big as it gets and, and as strong as it gets. Um, this, what ultimately ends up happening is the school's presidents and the entity's presidents begin to be changed as these trustees changed. Um, Larry Lewis is actually probably the really first notable shift. You want to know that name? Mm -hmm. Dr. Lewis was president of Hannibal LaGrange from, I think, 83 to 88. Does that sound right to you, R.O.? About right around there, 83 to 88. Dr. Lewis is there. Larry Lewis, an avowed conservative, is elected as president of the Home Mission Board in 1987 to take over in 1988 by a 52-15 vote of their trustees. They have 77 or 67 trustees. Wow, that's a lot. Uh, but <laughs> but they, they vote 52, and it stuns everybody. And at that point, these more moderate to liberal pastors and professors begin to realize things are changing in Baptist life. Baptist people hold to the Bible, and they want the things they support to be biblical. And if they're not going to be biblical, they're not going to have it. And so that is where it is. You know, there's two other things I'll highlight here for how bad it got. In a book by Nancy Ammerman, it's called Baptist Battles. She surveys seminary students at Southern and Southeastern Seminary in the late 80s. 
and she asks questions like this, and she looks at them in their first, as they enter the program, their first year, their second year, or their final year, and then if they go on to do like a PhD. So here's the question she asks. You, uh, student, do you, would you say, I know God exists? An entering student, 100%. Student at the end of the first year of their MDiv, 74% yes. Enter, uh, a student finishing their MDiv, 65% yes. A student in the PhD program, 63% yes. Jesus was born of a virgin. Entering students do, with a college, or college degree, 96% yes. First year MDiv student, 66% yes. Final year MDiv student, 33% yes. PhD student, 32% yes. What's happening? They're going to seminary, and it's ruining them. It's absolutely ruining them. I looked up one of the book titles uh, I have on my shelf. I forgot its name the other day. Ah, here it is. It's by Clayton Sullivan. He went to Southern Seminary. He wrote his biography after there and then serving in Baptist churches. It's called this, Called to Preach, Condemned to Survive, The Education of Clayton Sullivan. What he wrote was, he went to Southern, he stopped believing the Bible is true, he went to pastor, and then he could barely survive in any of these churches as all these Christian people said, teach the Bible. And he wanted to teach anything but. Baptists have always been a biblical people. Why do we hold to conversion? So, and why do we hold to baptism after conversion? Well, because that's what we read as we read our New Testament. Why do we go and seek to win the nations? Because, well, that's what Jesus told us to do. Why do we seek to win our neighbor? Because that's what Jesus told us to do when we read our Bible. Why do we seek to work with one another? Because we know we've got a project that it's way too big for any one of us, for any one church to do. Why are we always seeking to educate the next generation? Because we want them to love the Bible and love Jesus like we do. And so we've always been a biblical people. The conservative resurgence, which starts in 79 and has this series of elections, comes to its culminating point in 2000 with the revision of the 2000 Baptist faith and message. And therein, the, the Baptist faith and message is revised in such a way to finally tighten and stand against views that would say, I don't believe the Bible. In that meeting, phrases like the Bible is totally true and trustworthy are added to and highlighted there, and it is without error. In that meeting, I've watched the debate of it several times. There's a pastor from Texas, and he gets up and he's opposed to the revisions in the Baptist Faith and Message 2000 that are done there. And he begins to get up and he says, Ladies and gentlemen, I believe the Bible is the greatest book that is ever written. It is a book of literature, it is a book of history, it is a book of religious teaching, it is the finest book that there has ever been or ever will be. But ladies and gentlemen, I propose to you that the Bible is just a book. And his point, as he spoke against the Baptist faith in Message 2000, was that ultimately he did not believe the Bible is the word of God. It is, as Paul claims it to be, inspired by God. So friends, that concludes our overview of Southern Baptist history. Why don't I close us with a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Gracious Father, I thank you. I thank you that I get to be part of a church that loves your word, that loves studying your word. And I pray in everything we do, we would make much of your word and how it teaches us to live and love and follow your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you that I get to lead an institution that loves your word. 
I pray that each of us this week would go from church being reminded of the fight that has been waged to preserve your word as what we teach and what we hold high. And I pray as a result, each of us would go from church tonight recommitted to reading, to studying, to applying your word as it is, inspired by you, fully true, to our lives this week. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.